And hello, everyone. We're live. Um, welcome to our virtual presentation of the anti book with author Raphael Simon and our moderator, Adam Gidwitz. Uh, this event includes an audience Q&A, so to submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the very bottom of the screen. Uh, you can also vote for any question you'd like. Also, please consider supporting Roman's Bookstore by purchasing a copy of the anti-book or any of Raphael or Adam's books. We have a list of available books you can purchase on our website. Uh, just click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen and it'll take you to uh, our website where you can complete mm -hmm. your purchase. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, Roman's is the oldest independent bookstore in Southern California. We are 127 years old and it's thanks to avid readers like yourselves that keep our lights on. So every bit of support goes a very long way. All right. With that said, let me briefly introduce our guests and then we can just jump right in. Uh, tonight, we have the author of the anti-book, Raphael Simon, who is definitely not the alter ego of infamously anonymous author, Pseudonymous Bosch, the writer of the New York Times bestselling secret series and the bad books. And joining him tonight is Adam Gidwitz, the best-selling author of A Tale Dark and Grim in a Glass Grimly, the Newbery Honored Novel, The Inquisitor's Tale, and many more. So with that said, I'm going to turn off my camera and we'll get started. Enjoy the talk, everyone. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. But for what, Rafi, are you chewing gum during your oh. book launch? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I was just so excited. You know, there's gum in my book and I guess it was sort of rude. I should have offered to share. Here, yeah. here you can have some. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's good. Mm. I, mm. I thought you'd like it. Mm. Okay. Well, mm. I'm very honored to be here. You know what? I have to talk. I'm going to give it back, okay? okay. Here, just, just, just you take it. Okay, great. Okay. So. I don't um, know people don't like to share gum. <laughs> it's much better that way. I am very honored to be here with Rafi Simon. Um, he is not only an incredible author who has an enormous following of young people and adults who love his books, um, but he has, I just have to say, before we even get started, I need to like have a fan moment. Um, Mr. Simon oh, has please, been... Please stop, stop. No, no, I'm definitely not going to stop. Okay. Uh, really important you, really. <laughs> to my career. I... Uh, uh, had written um, a book about ancient Egypt, and I had the first version I had written this before I ever published a book. I had read out loud to students of mine, and I made it really interactive. I really spoke to them, but I thought to publish a book you couldn't do that, and so I rewrote the whole thing to sound as much like Johnny Tremaine as I could because I was a young writer and didn't know anything. Well, and that I, was what, we, what we had to write or read actually when we were little. We didn't. Yeah, know yeah, it. exactly. Mm -hmm. And I sent it to somebody who I wanted very much to be my agent. Her name is Sarah Burns. She is a brilliant and wise woman. And she read it and she said, this is really boring. And I told her what had happened that I had written another version. And I said, you can't really write a book like that though, can you? And she said, wait. And she sent me an ARC of this book. The name of this book is Secret, which opens with, as you all know, Warning, do not read beyond this page. And then you put it down. Boom. Now I know I can trust you. And I read the I read this ARC and it blew my mind. And it changed the way that I thought I was that I wrote because it told me I was allowed to write in a different way. Funnier, more immediate, in the second person sometimes. And Sarah became my agent and a tale dark and grim became my first book which is essentially just a copy of this with fairy tales. So I owe my entire career. What's that? I owe my entire career. It's not a copy. but it's, it's, it's pretty close. And you blurred it also. So I owe a ton to you. I just needed to get that out of the way. You're an incredibly important person in my life and so many other readers. Well, okay. thank you. And it was, Adam actually blurred my, my first book under my name. So it's kind of, it's definitely what goes around comes around. That's true. That's true. All right. I'm going to ask you some questions, but before I do that, I have to ask you a question. Should I, can I call you Rafi? No. Okay. Um, no, Mr. Simon. Okay. Right. <laughs> In the anti-book, do you have the anti-book with you? Can you hold it up? I only have a PDF. Is it this one? 
Beautiful. So gorgeous. In the ante book. Great. I'm just showing it off here. All right. And there's Adam's, there's right at the top. See, look. One of the many blurbs. Yeah. yeah. There it is. All right. Look, in that the book, screen, but. there right. is something called an ante book. In the ante book, there is something called an ante book. What is the ante book? Can you explain to us what it is and what it does? Well, the anti book uh, is a book within the book. So it's not just my book. It's also the book inside the book. And uh, it's a it's actually a blank book that the, the hero gets with the with a piece of gum, or rather a pack of gum, not not a piece of gum, a pack of gum, and uh, as a prize. And uh, it says inside to erase it, write it, and that's it. The rest is just a blank book. And, and it turns out what happens is anything that you write in this book will disappear. Uh, and for example, our hero, uh, he disappears uh, his sister because who wouldn't disappear their sister if they could? And, uh, and a fly. Uh, but then what happens is this house, a house fly. But then what happens is uh, as the story progresses, uh, we learn that things don't disappear forever. They kind of come back as sort of the inverse or the reverse or the opposite of, of the thing that they were. Uh, and it might just be as kind of a silly sort of word exchange, like the, the house fly becomes a fly house. Uh, again, on the cover of the book, you see uh, there's the fly house. Um, and the big, his big sister becomes a little sister. Or, you know, like, let's say uh, I disappeared to gum. Uh, it might come back as a mug uh, because, uh, you know, G-U-M spells M-U-G. You know, so it, it, things sort of flip around in, in different ways. Uh, Adam, would you, would you care to have a sip? No, oh, no, no. no. <laughs> okay, that was really, really funny. I got you rehearsed it. I hope everybody really enjoyed it. <laughs> the um, confidence is, is, is mind-blowing, everybody, um, how, how good we are at this. All right, so now that everybody knows what the anti-book within the anti-book is, um, we are going, I'm gonna ask a series of serious questions to Mr. Simon, but at the same time, I hope that you will all pose anti-questions in the, so you can ask serious questions by clicking on the ask a question button, but you can also ask anti-questions. Like for example, what candy would you write in the anti-book? And I will intersperse serious questions with anti-questions throughout this event. So right. you can put serious questions. So, I mean, so you'd ask that and I might say gum and then Adam would say that's not candy. Um, but I'd say but that's what we rehearsed. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like that. So I expect everyone to be putting anti-questions mm -hmm. in the ask a question as we go, um, great. I'm so excited that you're already, I can see people are already starting to do that. Okay. So you've told us a little bit about the novel, but maybe you wanna tell us the main character about the anti book, why he's attracted to it. And if you want, read us a couple pages. What do you think? Um, sure. So the anti book is about a 12 year old boy named Mickey. Uh, who, as we meet him, uh, is going through not just, uh, you know, the typical traumas of adolescence or pre-adolescence, but also his parents' divorce. Uh, both of his parents are marrying women named Charlie. And uh, he's getting bullied by his uh, sister's boyfriend, who keeps calling him uh, a in a way that's uh, a diss or insulting and at a time before he uh you know really understands what his identity is himself and basically he's just kind of angry at the world and doesn't he's kind of lost, lost his love of life he doesn't even like his dog anymore and uh he just wants everyone and everything to go away and it's at that uh at, at that point in his life that he finds the anti-book and he writes in it uh, a list essentially of everything and anything that he that he wants to disappear. And lo and behold, poof, it all goes away uh, and then starts to reappear. Uh, and uh, of course he has an adventure in what turns out to be this kind of empty but rapidly 
uh, filling in stranger and stranger anti world uh, and with his his little his little big sister uh, and the fly house and uh, you know other assorted crazy characters uh, in t and until he uh, ultimately uh, you know learns to appreciate all that he's lost. And it turns out, of course, that, that that's kind of the key to, to getting home, which is what he's trying to do. That is a very moving description of what happens in the book. And the book is very moving, everybody. So, you know, it has got all of the humor that you expect from a Rafi Simon pseudonymous Bosch book, but it is also moving to the point that I was crying pretty hard in rereading the book before this, in addition to the first time I read it. So just warning, laughter and tears on the way. Speaking of laughter, we have an anti-question, which is... Uh-oh. You ready? It's not exactly yeah. what I expected, but I like that. All right. Let's say you had to live your life as a frog. <laughs> what type of bug would be your breakfast, lunch, dinner, and dessert? And what color would you be? Answer any of the, any part of that that you want to or none of it. I won't answer any of it, but I will. I will. I will. Say, I will. Let, let's go. I will combine it. I will say, great. You know. You know what we do in 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 in, in our trade that you know we're like great question, and then you know you kind of like make it the question you want. Yeah. I'm going to make it the question that Adam wanted, which is what would you do if you put a frog? What would happen if you wrote frog in an anti book? And I think um, what is you'd get gruff backwards, right? Who has a frog? Let's, let's say let's say let's say gruff, but gruff. Am I wrong, Frog? Yeah. Gorf. Gorf. But Gorf. gruff, could, it could be gruff. Gorf. You're Gorf. the author. I just kind of feel like it would be something kind of gruff or gorfy or, and, and, and really kind of, and we could continue the kind of, uh, I'd continue to have a frog in my throat at the end of the day. That's why <laughs> <laughs> It would be very gorfy. I agree. I think everything is gorfy. Um, would you like to read a little bit of the book? Okay. Yes. Except that I, you know, I um I forgot that we were going to do this, so I didn't mark it. But I will um and I and I also I I sort of took Adam's suggestion about maybe what I would read, and it didn't even look at what it was. So oh. it's a surprise. Okay, this is chapter eight, page twenty six was my yeah, suggestion. I, I, you're saying to, you're saying to to end. You were saying twenty three to twenty six, really, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna. I'm gonna this is, it's better this way. It's gonna be fresh. Yeah. Oh yeah. Very oh, fresh. Worst. Mm. It'll be gorgeous. This is this is chapter eight uh, in the book, and it's called the chapter is called "Pop," with an exclamation mark. I know what you're thinking. It seems like Mickey doesn't like anything at all, but that isn't true. There's at least one thing he likes: bubble gum. See, hence, <laughs> have you ever looked under a desk and wondered who put all the gum there? Well, you don't have to wonder anymore. It was Mickey, mostly. Blows bubble, I'm gonna blow a bubble. All right, well, uh, pop, see? Here's a piece of advice. Don't chew gum in class. Here's another piece of advice. If against my previous advice, you choose to chew gum in class, don't blow bubbles. Here's another. If you simply must blow bubbles, let them gently deflate. Don't loudly pop them. And lastly, if one loud pop is irresistible, don't repeatedly, loudly pop bubbles after your teacher has told you not to. Depending upon your teacher's tolerance level, you may or may not be given another chance to stop popping them. Mickey's human development teacher has a three strikes rule, or in this case, a three pops rule. Today, after Mickey's third pop, his teacher sends him to the counselor's office. As it happens, Mickey's teacher is the counselor, He's sending Mickey to see himself. What's more, Mickey's teacher is Mickey's father. Yes, you read that correctly. Mickey's teacher equals Mickey's father equals Mickey's counselor. When he was promoted from soccer coach to school counselor, Mickey's father inherited the human development class. Do you know what's taught in human development? Trust me, it's the last subject you'd want your parent to teach. Mickey has to wait until class is over for his counselor or father to arrive. On the desk is a coffee mug decorated, decorated with a dozen or so emojis. At the bottom are the words, how are you feeling today? I think we'll, I think, I think that's. Oh, right. no, please, please. Leo, just like two more pages, oh, one more page. Well, I, <laughs> I love the next part so much. It's not intentional, but I will read, a little, I'll read another page if you think. I'm, I'm trusting Adam's, uh, 
Adam's judgment on this. Okay, Mickey looks from the mug to his reflection in the window. His face doesn't match any of the emojis, except maybe the one with the straight line for a mouth. Apparently, he's feeling blah. Finally, Mickey's father sits down opposite Mickey. Why do you test me like that, Mickey asks. You know I have to treat you just like any other student. Mickey shrugs. Was it the topic of today's class, the gender unicorn? I get it. It's embarrassing to hear your dad talk about that stuff. Well, guess what? I don't love it either, but it's my job. The gender unicorn is a chart in the form of a rainbow striped unicorn that teachers use to discuss subjects like gender identity and sexual orientation. It tends to make students giggle or else, as in Mickey's case, to blush uncontrollably. You told everyone I went through a unicorn phase, Mickey mutters, his face feeling hot all over again. You know I don't collect them anymore, right? Oh, come on, I'm just trying to lighten the mood. Consider yourself lucky. If you were homeschooled, I would teach all your classes, his father jokes. If I were homeschooled, you wouldn't teach me at all, Mickey responds, not smiling, since you don't live at home. Mickey's father purses his lips. According to the emoji mug, he is feeling frustrated. <laughs> And the parents just got divorced. Just that's hence Mickey's right. or Uber burn. Oof, that scene yeah. makes me laugh and cringe yeah. at just equal yeah. measure. I love it. I was, uh, yeah, I was sort of pleased for his burn on Mickey's behalf. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to admit, and and I, I ask, like, get him. Yeah, yeah, when when you write a, a burn like that or something like that, do, what 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 do you do? Do you like go? You know, like. I, you know, what's your reaction when you think of something that great? You know, I like in a situation like that where if I'm really into it, I'll like look like a crazy person and look like I'm talking to myself basically, and just sort of look. Um, actually, that as it happens, that that particular conversation, that scene, uh, was one of the hardest to write in the book, and I rewrote it many times. There were longer versions, shorter versions. I would like, I went on and on, and I was like, this is too serious and too much. And then I cut it out and I was like, oh, this is, this is vital and I need this in the book. It was actually, it was, it was, it was a tough one for some reason. I really feel like you nailed it. I feel Maybe like, like because relationships with fathers are tough. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you, you came to the right version of that scene. Okay, next question in the anti um, uh, model. If you could write one fashion trend into the anti book, what would it be? If I oh, this is from the uh, I was like, really? This is, this doesn't sound like Adam. <laughs> <laughs> this is the auto participation part. All right. If I could write a fashion trend into the anti book, what would it be? Um, you know, it might have to be the these like low crotched pants that um <laughs> that, that are uh, that are that are that are popular right now that don't that feel like diapers when i try them on and uh you know and and, and i and, and it would be sort of gratifying to i guess if suddenly everybody had a low crotch had a really high one and so you know it gave them a sort of goosing um, <laughs> <laughs> the style, all the way up. The reverse. How's it? How's um, that? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm now going to ask you a serious question, but I have to say I'm nervous about this first serious question. All right. Because the last time you and I did a Q and A together, and this is true, yeah. I asked a question and in front of hundreds of teenagers at a teen book festival, and unintentionally, I think I made you cry. And Not only that, you completely rocked my world, but go on. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so my question is, uh, what did I say? Uh, okay, well, to be fair, I don't think you were trying to make me cry. I wasn't. Uh, uh, I, so Adam and I were in one of these conversations, uh, rather like this, only in person, so that... Um, uh, you know, it's that much harder, I guess, to to hide. Um, and Adam asked uh, me to tell a story about an experience that I'd had when I was a kid that was really embarrassing. And, you know, I think Adam wanted me to come up with a funny anecdote that would make kids laugh and seem relatable, I imagine. And, uh, 
I think he had a poop story that he wanted to tell that was you know, <laughs> like, like he was maybe maybe his whole aim was to get himself to be you know set up get set up for this poop story. Yeah. Uh, you know, so and at the time I knew what kind of story he was expecting me to tell and what I should be telling and you know something you know something funny and that would show the audience that we were real people and that you know just like them and that therefore maybe they could be writers too and you know kind of human it was like a humanizing thing and whatever whatever i knew what he wanted i i was but i froze i was completely uh, stymied and the only thing only, my, the only thing i could think of was a story from my past from seventh grade when i was the same age as mickey in the anti-book when victoria Harmon, victoria if you're listening i actually <laughs> victoria although i don't know if she remembers this at all uh, <laughs> When Victoria, then known as Vicky, just in case there was anybody who was at CES with us who really wants to you know, uh, go back, uh, when she she had just heard somewhere that one in ten people were gay, and she went around the schoolyard counting people and saying one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and any time she got to ten, she would point at me, and you know, it was not as as like kind of you know, gay bullying goes, it wasn't the worst in the world and we were actually sort of friends. So I don't know quite how maliciously she meant it. And, uh, but I froze then similarly to how I froze uh, with Adam, not knowing what to say uh, and feeling completely exposed, even though at the time, I, I not only wasn't out because unlike today, most 12 year olds were not uh, out of the closet in those days, but I wasn't even out to myself. You know, I wouldn't have known. I wouldn't have, I, it's not like I, I, you know, it was, it wasn't, it was almost a kind of a nameless anxiety more than it was certainly a, and not even close to a full fledged identity at the time. But somehow I felt like she was seeing something uh, in, in about me that maybe I wasn't seeing it. And, and I tried to laugh about it and, you know, and joke about it and deflect it and whatever. But, uh, you know, it, it, well, clearly it stuck with me to the point where I was on stage with Adam many years later, um, you know, back in that place. And when, I, and, and he, when I, uh, and I, but I couldn't tell the story when I was on stage with Adam because at the time I was there as pseudonymous Bosch, not as Rafi Simon. And as pseudonymous, you know, I was closeted in every way. I mean, not, you know, nobody knew who I was. Nobody was supposed to know my real name or anything about me. And I ha and I wasn't necessarily straight. I wasn't like, pseudonymous Bosch wasn't necessarily heterosexual, but he didn't, I, neither had, I had he slash I ever come out in any way. And, I, I I realized at the time that I suddenly, you know, as I was sort of like stammering, as I'm starting to stammer now, and you know, there on stage with Adam, just how closeted and and and, and stifled I was beginning to feel um, as as Sudanus Bosch in, in the in the past when I had done school visits, you know, or interviews where somebody had said, or some kid had said, are you married? Or, you know, somebody, you know, do you have a girlfriend? That kind of thing. I was just able to make a joke as pseudonymous Bosch and not, uh, and say, I, well, I don't, you know, I don't reveal that or just say I live alone with my animals or whatever I said. Um, and I, I didn't have to feel guilt, guilty like I was, you know, uh, being closeted about being gay because I was in character as pseudonymous. But, but, but suddenly that began to feel like I'd been making, it had, like it's just been a convenient excuse. And, um, and I realized that I wanted to be more myself in every way as a writer on and off the page. Um, and it took a little while. Uh, but ultimately, I mean, I think there's a fairly direct line to me, to my experience with Adam on stage that day to writing a book with my name on it, uh, that's called the anti book that's with us here. And, uh, this is, it's kind of, it's, 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 it's very, uh, you know, I have to say it's a little bit moving for me to have, to have my name on a book for various reasons. Um, 
you know, it's something that I, I sort of grew up wanting to have. And then when, when I became pseudonymous Bosch and published 11 books before this, uh, that was always exciting, but, and especially at the beginning, but there was also a little part of me that's like, where's my picture? Where's my name? <laughs> and, um, uh, so, you know, so, there was a, you know, it, it, there was a little ego, ego gratification that was being delayed uh, all that time too. Anyway, that's a uh, rather that long answer to, to Adam's question about uh, that traumatic day at the book festival. I think it's uh, the answer that everybody needed to hear. It's like the so moving um, as everyone is noting, but um, so it feels a little bit like just to belabor the point that in a grand sense, the anti-book is your coming out book, not as gay, but as you, is that right? Yeah, and what's uh, what's what's um, what's funny about it is uh, on the you know it's it's a it's you might think that my first Raphael Simon book would would not be a might be an adult book or might be a naturalistic book um, and not another fan, fantastical middle grade book. But the funny thing is, I think that that's really who I am on some level. And some people have commented both in reviews, but also just tell, you know, talking to me about it. it. It sounds a little bit pseudonymous boshy at times, but of course, you know, I, as much as I felt like I began to feel like pseudonymous Bosch was this mask or, or disguise it, or whatever. Also, of course, that's me too. And, you know, without trying that's you know there's going to be a little bit of that voice in my writing especially i i guess writing uh middle grade but yeah you yeah. know anyway. um I, I i could go farther into that but i think you dealt with it gorgeously and somebody has the really interesting question if you could write a children's book trope into the anti-book what would it be what children's book trope would you write into the anti-book? You know, I don't know. The first thing that comes to mind is a children's book trope, of course, is like, is, you know, dead parents. Um, but, uh, you know, it's something that I've, you know, I've certainly uh, used. And then, I mean, there's a reason for it because it allows, you you know, allows for uh, kids to have adventures unimpeded by those, you know, annoying adult figures <laughs> that impede most of our, most of our lives as children. Um, uh, you know, so I, I don't, I think that would, I, I, that's what comes to mind at the same time. And, and at the same time, you know, I might be shooting myself in the foot. <laughs> <laughs> you need to kill parents and whatever your next book is, probably it's going to, it's going to have to have. All right. This book is back to the book. itself. Would you, this, yeah, would you have a different answer, Adam? Just quickly. Uh, yeah, well, I would never get rid of that trope. First of all, because I always kill the parents every yeah. single time. And yeah. second of all, then we would lose, my favorite, one of my favorite moments in all of children's literature, which is the very beginning of James and the Giant Peach, oh, when yeah. Roald Dahl kills oh. off James's parents by saying absolutely. they were eaten absolutely. by a rampaging rhinoceros, which is just absolutely right. the best way to kill parents that, that exists. Right. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Back to the anti book. The, the anti book, the book itself. The structure is unique, as far as I can tell, unlike any book that I have read. How did you come up with it? How did you come up with this crazy idea, concept, and structure? Well, the title was first hmm. before anything else, which actually, incidentally, that was my experience with the last, with the name of this book, A Secret, too. Um, that book was, uh, you know, I came up with, the, you know, to, to, to go backwards uh, just for a second, uh, you know, with the name of this book, A Secret, I was supposed to be uh, writing a, a book for. Uh, my friend Margie's daughter, May, in this uh, volunteer program at her school. And uh, I was supposed to send her writing and I, and I wanted to send her a novel, but I didn't have one. And then I couldn't think of one and I couldn't even think of a title. And then I thought, well, maybe I don't know what it's called because the name of this book is Secret. <laughs> and that was the beginning of uh, that book. Uh, it all kind of came out of that. Um, and in a similar way, actually, about 10 years ago, I just, the, the title, I don't remember ex exactly where I was or what I was thinking about, but but the title, the anti-book popped into my head. And uh, as just, and, and I was like, I kind of, that's, that sounds like a book I want to write. And I, but I didn't, and then I just sort of were toying with it and what's an anti-book. And to me, books, 
you know, are uh, 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 they're not objects just that are created. They're objects that create. They're, they they create worlds. They create you know ideas and visions and fantasies and universes and um, and so I thought if, if if a book if a normal book creates things or a normal novel certainly, uh, what does an anti book do? It sort of you know it, it makes things disappear. It uncreates things. Uh, so that so it was sort of like that was you know the kind of what the opposite of a book, it's an anti-book. Um, and then, so that that was kind of the origin of that, of that concept. Um, and, you know, at, at the same time, I knew, I, I kind of wanted to write a more personal book. So that's where some of these, you know, uh, some of these I, I, ideas uh, about the character of Mickey came from, uh, from my own childhood. I, you know, when I was his age, my parents were getting divorced. Um, you heard the story about Vicky Harmon. Are you out there, Vicky? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so uh, and I and I was, you know, and I, you know, I, I would say frankly, I, I, I struggled with depression my entire life, uh, off and on, uh, more often on, and uh, that kind of began, I think, around that time in my life, uh, around the time of my parents divorced. And um, so that, so some of the, so some of the themes of the book and the characters came out of that. Um, so I had, so, th so I had this character who is loosely based on me, uh, very loosely. And I had uh, this concept of a book that uh, makes things disappear. Um, and, you know, I sat down to, outline the story and I think I got as far as he makes things disappear <laughs> which is pretty much as far and then I then I started you know which is pretty much as far as I ever got in my thinking and I, you know so I, well, I start, this happens with all of my books in some ways or other I always think I should outline from beginning to end and I always get halfway through uh, and get stuck and eventually think well I have to start writing or I'll never write anything and then of course I get stuck halfway through again as I'm writing because I haven't outlined the, the next part <laughs> I literally, it, like, it was only after I was really, you know, it, it, the, the notion of, I, I, I knew that, like, uh, things disappeared, then what was it going to be? I mean, I didn't, I didn't know what was, the, what was going to come after, like, the, the first act break, you know, essentially. Um, you know, I thought about the, the, you know, the inspiration books were Phantom Tollbooth, I would say primarily in Wizard of Oz and Alice in Wonderland a little bit ultimately. Um, but I didn't, I, so I kind of was like, okay, well, the world's going to be empty and he's, he's going to travel the world. Um, it's, anyway, it took a little bit of time to kind of uh, really figure out the mechanism of the book and then how, how, how the characters would get, evolve and then, then the, 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 and then the structure came out of that. Um, you know, my our agent Sarah Burns had been very was very encouraging from the beginning with this book, and my editor Laurie Hornick at Dial mm -hmm. was really helpful in terms of, especially in terms of like drawing out from from me. I don't even think she quite realized how she was doing it, but with the second half of the book and trying to figure out how, you know, how it would work, and how and also of course how to make the the, the humor and the emotional beats sort of you know work together. Um. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm ra now I'm rambling. <laughs> um, I have to ask you another anti-question because otherwise I'm not being uh, honest to the form. But there are also so many great questions in this that we might quickly go to soon go to those. But somebody asked if you have a theme song, and I want to know what th song or theme song would you write in the anti-book. So feel free to write to answer either question. A theme song for the anti-book. Oh my gosh. Or no, just you personally. Do you have one, or what song would you write in the anti book if you just could get rid of a song? Mm. Oh, the ho holiday songs are coming to me right now, mainly. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I feel like I feel like anything that I say is just going to seem really misanthropic. <laughs> you Scrooge. A lot of Christmas and Hanukkah songs that are coming to mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we won't name them so you don't get a lot of hate. Especially since it, uh, there's a there's a, a, a holiday theme in the book. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm not, I'm, I'm gonna go on from there. 
Okay, great. Um, I because there are so many questions in the in the list, I'm going to ask you one more question. Also, you've answered most of the questions that I wanted to ask you, so I'm going to ask you one more, and then we're going to go into the reader or the viewer questions. Okay. So, you talked about being kind of depressed as a kid, your parents getting divorced, getting teased, um, and those things clearly all influence the anti book. But it was not only pain and suffering that led you to become a writer and write this book. What do you? What did you do as a kid that led to you being a writer now? Do you think anything is that there's anything kids could do, or teachers or parents could encourage kids to do? The short answer for me is reading. Um, and you know, I, I'll say something that's going to be very the kids are going to hate to hear, and some parents might like to hear. But really, I, I feel like I'm betraying the kids by 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 saying this. It's just that we didn't, because not only when I was a kid was there, uh, you know, very few video games and no internet. We also at my house didn't even have TV. Um, uh, we like we had we had um, a VCR. We had a VCR in which I could watch, you know, Star Wars and and uh, over and over again, basically, <laughs> but, but nothing else. <laughs> um, so I, you know, and that's one reason that I read a lot. I was also slightly alienated from my peers, and that's another reason I read a lot. Um, so I, I read all the time, and so it was sort of not, and in some sense, kind of natural that I, be, you know, started writing, and, and particularly started writing for kids uh, because of all the books I read as a kid. Um, I, will, I, will say right. this, I will say this: that it's, it's. There's no doubt that it's harder to focus on on reading nowadays for everyone uh with so much media and that that's you know for adults and for kids um but at the same time you know i think that and i this is I, i'm a father of 12 year old girls so i see a lot of this in my own house you know there that's i mean it's not all bad from a lot of perspectives and in one perspective uh, to, uh, that, is, that i see it's just in terms of literacy i mean they're different kind, like to be to be a reader and ultimately to be a writer isn't only to read novels like adam and i write um you know they you know reading and writing texts is writing and writing reading and writing you know comments reading and you know on a on a chat board or when you're playing a game is, is reading and writing. Um, and uh, there are different kinds of storytelling being devolved, you know, be evolving out of the different kinds of reading that's going on now. So, so, so I do think the answer is to, is to read a lot, but I, but I don't necessarily mean you, I mean, you know, well, first of all, there are graphic novels and all other kinds of books that aren't just you know, straightforward novels like ours, um, but but there's also a, a, a world of text out there that's evolving, um, that's, that's that's different from our own. And I think that uh, when you know to to separate books in particular from the kind of vast media universe is a disservice to writing, and it's different. Diff and, and for kids, it's kind of I don't know, frustrating <laughs> and, and not the best way. To, so, so I, so, so I say to, yes, so I say reading, but it doesn't have to only be uh, read, reading novels and, um, and writing, but it doesn't have to only be, you know, writing fiction. Or, yeah. And even uh, one of my daughters, both of my daughters really are into fan fiction right now and they both read and write that a lot and I consider them good writers and good readers and wouldn't be surprised if either or both of them wind up uh you know writing for a living later on although I don't no pressure. I, I wish it on them necessarily but <laughs> <laughs> um well just to to cite an authority far greater than you on what you did you apparently your second grade teacher is with us tonight and she says you loved to read and write did you realize that Miss Brock Erickson from your second grade uh, Miss Carpenter, uh, second grade Carpenter class is here? I, I'm not seeing the same comments that you are. So forgive me, people, that I'm not seeing exactly what Adam's seeing. Miss Brock was my absolute favorite teacher, and I will actually tell us a, 
I can tell several stories about her. Well, when direct, about me coming into that her class, I, I'd gone to, in kindergarten and first grade, I went to a place called Area H Alternative School, uh, which was exactly what it sounds like, an alternative to school. <laughs> you didn't have to learn or study anything, including reading, unless you wanted to. And I wanted to make, uh, as they're now called, I, we called them God's Eyes at the time, yarn around sticks. I think they're called something else now. Anyway, that's all I did there. So then I went into this rather conventional elementary school where uh, in second grade, uh, Carpenter Avenue School, I cannot believe, Ms. Brock, you're out there. <laughs> <laughs> That's just mind-blowing right now. Um, this is I, your I'm life. Speaking like I'm having, you know, I, I, that really I'm having an out-of-body experience. Um, <laughs> so uh, I went into second grade at Carpenter Avenue School uh, not being able to read and discovering that all of my, that the, all, all my peers already could because they'd been learned to read in first grade and it was humiliating. And uh, I learned, you know, I learned to read very quickly in the space of two weeks because humiliation uh, is a strong motivation. I, you know, I don't know that I would necessarily recommend it as the way <laughs> <laughs> that's the best for people, but it certainly worked with me. Uh, <laughs> but I always, but I felt for years uh, that I wasn't as smart as the other kids because they could read before I did. Um, even though obviously I was a fast learner, but it didn't, to me, it didn't seem like that at the time. It just seemed like they knew things that I didn't know. Um, anyway, I, I adored Miss Brock, just adored her. And I remember she had story time all the time and we, all the kids would gather around and kind of for the privilege of massaging her shoulders, uh, while she read to us and she was pretty much my favorite person in the world. And, you know, clear, clear, clearly uh, ta taught me to read rather effectively too. Um, she says you were brilliant in case you can't see her comment. No, I, I can't, I, I literally can't. She says you you were brilliant. I'm also gonna make up other things she's saying about you now. No, okay. I won't. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, we only have a few more minutes um, and I wanna, there are a few burning questions out there that multiple people have asked. So the one that is getting the most, you know, um, amplification in the question list, so I have to ask it is, is it true? Are the rumors true that there is some sort of filmic or television adaptation of the name of this book, A Secret, in the works? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I let slip to the interviewer uh, for Publishers Weekly something to that effect, perhaps, but. Uh, not only because you know we're everything about the secret series is always supposed to be KG, but also I'm not sure that um, it was exactly kosher with the Hollywood powers that be. <laughs> for me. They do be the Hollywood powers do be. However, <laughs> it's it's just barely possible. Uh, it's out okay. there that Netflix is developing a movie, and I would say that the and it's a. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw uh, the Twilight Zone, no, or no, not the Twilight, the Mirror, Black Mirror episode uh, that was interactive called, um, now it's, the name is escaping me, maybe somebody will remember, it's in the comments. Um, but they're definitely, they're developing their interactive slate and it's, and you know, somebody reading the name of this book is secret and knowing how the, it's, the, the, the nature of the writing is meant to be interactive and they're in fact kind of, Different plot lines invoked uh, at different at different possible at different times. They might think that, that that potentially the name of this book is secret might lend itself to an interactive ad adaptation. Um, so that's all. I hope you didn't say too much because that was amazing. Everyone in the comments mm -hmm. is going crazy right now. So the excitement is high mm -hmm. in the room. Just so you know. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I, we only have just a couple minutes left. A couple of people have asked. Is there some interaction with a young reader that you've had that has really stuck with you over the years? Well, you know, yes, but it's been several readers and, you know, you know, going back, like, even as uh, I was beginning to feel so closeted uh, as pseudonymous Bosch, um, for some reason, I think that it may be, uh, my my gayness 
for lack of a better noun, um, uh, was coming out because I have gotten so many, you know, a, a lot. I, I, I would venture to say that a lot that I'm sure, Adam, I'm sure you've gotten a lot of very moving mail from kids talking about how you've inspired them to write. And I, yeah. that's really always wonderful to get. But I've also gotten a lot of kids saying, uh, you uh, inspired me to come out or made me, or made me feel uh, like I wasn't alone as a gay person, which was very wonderful to hear and moving, although surprising to me often because, you know, they're, they've, the, they're, the, they're the cast in the secret series, the heroine cast were grandfathers or a gay couple, but it's kind of understated, uh, you know, and I, and I will say it's bec because I never, literally say they're a couple, even though they live together and travel together. And it's be clear to anybody who say lived in Los Angeles or New York or Chicago, but especially, you know, when the first book was published in 2007, I would say you know, there weren't as many uh, gay couples in represented in, in the media. So it would, I think it would, was probably possible for that not to be clear to some people. Um, and I, you know, and that was, I, I, Kind of hate to say slightly intentional because I didn't. I, that in terms of not wanting to, even though it was important me, to me to represent them uh, as, as, a, as a gay couple, I also, you know, wasn't actively courting controversy. Um, but nonetheless, that came through, and and perhaps something about the the you know the voice of pseudonymous Bosch or the, the characters of Cass, Cass and Max Ernest that you know that they because they didn't fit into conventional molds maybe and were outsiders, um, you know, and perhaps the theme of secrecy, all kinds of different, you know, things uh, there. And then ultimately, I, I guess, me coming out in a public way uh, a few years ago uh, inspired some really, really terrific uh, letters uh, from kids and young adults and now, I mean, I don't know, 20, 22, 23 year olds, adults, um, you know, uh, talk, talk, talking about how uh, my books made them understand uh, their identity a little better and feel better about it. And I, you know, nothing, uh, nothing to a writer is more special than that. Yeah. Well, speaking of special, everyone, uh, please click on the green button at the bottom of this chat or this these screens to purchase um, the anti book. It is indeed a very special book. Um, Rafi, any any last words you want to say before we sign off here tonight? No, just th th thank thank you, Adam. This that uh, it was really, you, we, Adam has just been really generous with this book, uh, and I, and I'm very grateful. Very uh, happy book. And um, you know, I just, I'm excited to this, thank you all for being here. This is a, a lot, my first event in the, in the, in the, with my first book with my name on it in this unprecedented weird time. Um, and, uh, you know, in normal life, I might've had a party, uh, but sadly that's not happening, but I, it was really lovely to be with all of you and thank you for coming. Yeah, we wish we could have thrown you a party too at our store. So <laughs> once things go back to normal, hopefully uh, we we can have you at our store and um, you know like have people there to celebrate your book and your launch. Um, again, thank you so much to everyone who tuned in and for sending in your wonderful questions. Again, um, we do have um, all of all of Adams and. Uh, Rafi's books listed, just uh, click on the green purchase button and it'll take you to our website where you can complete your purchase. Also, for those of you who tuned in late, don't worry, uh, a replay of this talk will be available oh, no. very shortly. Uh, just just <laughs> use the same stream link and you'll be able to rewatch. No, 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 no. <laughs> and I think that about covers mm -hmm. it. Uh, thank you again, everyone, and stay safe. All right. Good night. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Bye. Mm-hmm.